Parshas Nitzavim <coughs> contains the Parsha of Tshuva. In, we discussed this last year, and uh, we'll return to the Parsha again. It says, V'haya ki yevavu olecha kal advarim ha'ela, ha'bracha v'aklala, when all these things befall you, the blessings and the curses, asher nasata l'fanecha, that I placed before you, You'll take them to heart. And all the places where Hashem has banished you. So the Torah tells us that in Golos, we realize that we've lived through the brachas and the klolos, we'll take it to heart. What will happen? You'll return to Hashem. The Shemat of the call, listen to his voice. As I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and all your soul. So the Post is telling us that in Golos, in Golos, Christ will repent. What will the consequence of that be? God will return your captives and have mercy upon you and gather you from all the nations, even if you are exiled to the end of the earth, from there God will gather your wind, will bring you to Eretz Yisrael, and you'll be better off than your father's words. The Torah tells us, again, that the tshuva of the Achir Sayamim will take place in Golos. When Klai Yisrael is in Golos, they will realize from their experience of the brachas and klalos, the truth, they'll return to Hashem, and accordingly Hashem will gather in the exiles. And then something else will happen. God will circumcise your heart, the heart of your children. This mila saleh, the circumcision of the heart, this will take place in Eretz Yisrael. And as a consequence of that, it says, Hashem will take all the curses and put them on your enemies. And then the Pesach says something surprising. It says, Va'ata toshut, and you will return, v'shemat b'kar l'Hashem, and listen to the voice of Hashem, v'yosisas ko mitzvayisav asher anoichi mitzat chayom, and perform all the mitzvahs that I command today. Va'ata toshut, you will repent, seems to imply a second shuva. The first tshuva, which is v'shaf da'ad Hashem al-Lekecha, is in Golos. And now in Eretz Yisroel, after the Mila Salev, after the circumcision of the heart, there'll be a second tshuva, the Ata Toshuv. And as a consequence of the second tshuva, there'll be even greater blessings. Hashem will give you abundance, children, livestock, produce, Hashem will rejoice to bestow good upon you as he rejoiced over your fathers. The Malbim says a very interesting thing. That earlier it says that as a consequence of the first tshuva, you'll be better off than your forefathers. Here, as a consequence of the second tshuva, it says Hashem will rejoice to bestow good upon you as he rejoiced to do so over your fathers, which seems to imply you'll only be equal to your fathers, which seems to make very little sense. If the second tshuva is a better tshuva, more intense tshuva, there should be greater rewards. So the Malam says a fascinating thing. He says that the earlier reference to Ave Secha refers to your own immediate fathers. You'll be better off than your immediate fathers. The second Ave Secha is a reference to the Abbas HaKadosh, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. It means Hashem will rejoice to bestow good upon you just as He rejoiced to bestow good upon Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. That's certainly even a greater brother. And this will be when? When you listen to His voice, to observe His mitzvahs, when you return to Hashem, so the Pasuk seems to imply there are two tshuvas. There's one tshuva which takes place in Golos, that's the Shaft to Hashem and that brings the Kibbutz Goliath, 
And then in Eretz Yisroel, there'll be the Mila Salev, the circumcision of the heart, and the second Shuvah, the Yata Toshuv, and the consequence of the second Shuvah will be the greater abundance that Hashem promises us. In what way is the second Shuvah greater than the first Shuvah? So we spoke of last year the observation of the Malbim, that with regards to the first Shuvah, it says, Vashavta ar Hashem alakala. You will return up to Hashem. And with regards to the second shuva, it says, Ki soshuv el Hashem alakecha. El Hashem. So el is more intense than ad. And the Malbim doesn't explain what way it's more intense. But it's clearly a reference to what the Ramam writes in Heshaya. In Heshaya, we also have these two expressions. It says, first, shuva Yisroel ar Hashem alakecha. Return ar Hashem alakecha. Then it says, mm-hmm. So even after we've already been commanded, we are told now take words and return El Hashem. <coughs> there the Malcolm says that Shuva Ad Hashem is Shuva Meira, Shuva motivated by fear. Shuva El Hashem is Shuva motivated by Abba. And we know from the Gemara and Yuma that Shuva Me'ahav is greater than Shuva Me'ira. The Gemara asks a contradiction. And one member, it says, G'day la Shuva, Shuva is great. She's dainais nasu l'shkagais. Averis, they were done the nasib, become inadvertent sins. Another member says, G'day la Shuva, she's dainais nasu l'shuyas. Deliberate sins become mitzvahs. So which is it? They become inadvertent sins, or do they turn into mitzvahs? The Gemara says, like Hashem, no contradiction. Hamir or Hamayava. If the truth is motivated by fear of Hashem, the deliberate sins become inadvertent sins. But if the truth is motivated by love of Hashem, then these donuts become suyas, they become merits. Shuvah Me'ava is greater. So here too, the first Shuva says the Malbim, is the Shuvah Me'ira. That Shuvah will take place in Golos, and that Shuvah will bring the Kibbutz Golos. In Eretz Yisrael will be a milas lev, and the Pasuk says that the milas lev will be li'ahavas Hashem alekecha. Our hearts will be circumcised, that we should come to avas Hashem, and then va'ata toshav, then you'll repent. So the tshuva me'ahavo brings so much more blessing, because it's a greater tshuva, there will be blessed in the same way that the avas hakadoshim were blessed. That's what the Malcolm says, and last year we spoke this all out. Just want to point out, two observations. That in the comparison of the first shuva to the second shuva, we find two very important differences. With regards to the first shuva, the shuva of Chutz Laret, it says, the shaft ad Hashem you'll return to Hashem, the shamat of the kolo, you'll listen to his voice. There is no explicit mention of shmira semitzvahs, of observance of mitzvahs. You'll return to Hashem, and you'll listen to his voice. Whereas with regards to the second shuva, it says, Ve'ata Toshuv, you will repent. This is the shuva of Eretz Yisrael. And there it says, V'shamat b'kayl Hashem, you'll listen to the voice of Hashem, V'asisa eskol mitzvah and you'll perform all the mitzvahs. So why is it that the performance of the mitzvahs in practice is only mentioned with regards to the shuva of Eretz Yisrael and not with regards to the shuva of the mountain touches on this point. And the mountain says that really, because the observance of all mitzvahs is only possible in Eretz Yisrael. In Chutz there's so many mitzvahs that we can't do. So therefore, that's why the 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 asisas kol mitzvahs of is only written with regards to the shuvah of Eretz Yisrael. I don't know if this answer is satisfying, because it's true you can't do all the mitzvahs in Chutz but We certainly can do many. But there's no mention of performing any mitzvahs in Chutz Laretz. There's also another interesting thing. This is an observation the Ramban makes, that when it says that we'll do tshuva in Golos, it says, Ato uvanecha, you and your children. There's an emphasis on the fact that it won't just be that you repent, but that your children will repent with you. We'll explain the Ramban at a later point, in later detail. But when it comes to the tshuva of Eretz Yisrael, 
Here it almost appears that the Torah goes out of its way to emphasize the fact that it, the children are not included. Here it says, Va'ata Kashuv, and you will repent. As if to say that the tshuva there is Israel for some reason doesn't include the children. The tshuva is chutzlaras, the tshuva is golos, is atu vonecha, and the tshuva eretz Israel is ba'ata tashuv, and you will repent. Which at first glance is hard to understand. If the tshuva of eretz Israel is a greater tshuva, and we're zayich is so much more, why do the children fall away? Only in the tshuva of chutzlaras, and golos, is atu vonecha. And the truth of Eretz Yisrael, it's va'ata tashu. The bonim, the children are left out. Okay, put these observations in the back burner. Let's go a little bit ahead. The Torah continues. Ki mitzvah hazayish. This mitzvah which I command you, lo niflesimim chai, isn't far away from you, lo rechai kohi. It's not pashemayim, it's not ne'ever le'yam. It's very close to you. So it is in your mouth and in your heart to perform. And what is this referring to? So here is a machlekes three shayim. Rashi says it refers to the Torah generally. Now Shem is saying that uh, it's easy to observe the Torah. You don't have to go up to heaven. You don't have to cross the ocean. The observance of the Torah is b'fiqa u'luvavcha. The Ramban, famous Ramban, says that a mitzvah hazais is a reference to tshuva. Tshuva, which is mentioned in the earlier parsha. Tshuva is a mitzvah the Ramban holds. It's not just that the Torah is telling us that we will repent. The Torah is commanding us to repent. But it's telling us that, that command is not as difficult as one would think. You don't have to go up to heaven. You don't have to go across the Yam. It's b'picha u'luvav chalasoso. And Ramban says that what does it mean when we say that tshuva is in your mouth and in your heart? <coughs> so the uh, Ramban explains that b'picha is a reference to vidui. She is vadu es avoynam ves avon avoysam befihem. So Bepicha is a reference to Vidui. And Bilvavcha means Vyashuvu Bilvavam, they'll return in their hearts, Al Hashem. Vyakablu Aleyem Hayom Ha Torah Ledoiras. And they will accept the Torah for future generations. Which is the Kabbalah Lahabba. The acceptance Lahabba. These are, of course, two very important elements of Chuba Vidui and Kabbalah Lahabba. So that's what the Torah is saying when it tells us that tshuva is b'picha u'bovavcha. B'picha is a reference to vidui, and b'bovavcha is a reference to the Kabbalah l'habba. There's a famous mimer from a Mitzvah Petterberger who asks two questions in this Ramban. And the first question he asks is a general question. That if the parsha is talking about tshuva, it seems very strange. It's telling us that tshuva is not difficult. You don't have to go up to heaven, you don't have to cross the ocean. It's easy to do tshuva. So our experience is not so. Our experience certainly is that tshuva is very, very difficult. That's his first question. Because how can the Torah be minimizing the difficulty of tshuva? We know it's difficult. The second question is that we know that tshuva has many elements. First, there has to be charata. That's to be remorse for the past. There has to be aziva sachet. You have to stop doing the sin. There has to be Kabbalah Lahabba, a resolution for the future to do the right thing. And there has to be Vidui. And these are Bukhara, four different elements of Tshuva. So ask the Bittal Petrenberger, so if the Pasuk is telling us that Tshuva is easy, why does it only mention two of the four? It only mentions, as Ramban says, Bapicha, which is the Vidui, and Bobavcha, which is the Kabbalah Lahabba. What happened to the Aziva Sachet? And what happened to the Chayrat? So Bitzel Petterberger says that these two questions answer each other up. Because if we ask ourselves, what is really difficult about tshuva? What are the difficult aspects of tshuva? So the first, the most important difficulty, is stopping doing the Aveira. That's what is very difficult. 
The Aziva Sachet, that's the real, real difficulty of the tshuva. But the reality is that Aziva Sachet is not an obligation that the mitzvah of tshuva imposes upon us. Let's say a person has been eating treif. Day in, day out, eat treif, eat treif, eat treif. So he has to stop eating treif, Aziva Sachet. Now why does he have to stop eating treif? Because the mitzvah of tshuva? He has to stop eating treif because it's a mitzvah to eat treif. But the Aziva Sachet is not something which the mitzvah of tshuva imposes. That's something you have to do anyway. Furthermore, says the mitzvah, so once a person stops doing the Aveira, Chayrata will come naturally. So of course you'll feel remorse. We don't feel remorse because we don't want to recognize that what we've been doing is wrong. But if we talk and give up the Chet, in a very short time, the Chayrata will be triggered almost automatically. That's also not difficult. And it's really not an obligation which Tshuva imposes. It's something which will be a male. It will happen by itself. So what are the extra special obligations of the Mitzvah of Tshuva? What does the Mitzvah of Tshuva obligate us to do? The Mitzvah of Tshuva tells us it's not enough simply to feel Harata. You have to verbalize the Harata. That's Vidui. And it's not simply enough to be Ozev the Chet, to stop doing the sin. You have to make a resolution never to do it again. That's Kabbalah Lahawa. So he says that really, although Tshuva has four elements, two of them are not obligatory because of the mitzvah of tshuva. Two of them would happen anyway. The aziva sachet, because you're mukhiv not to do the chet, and the charat is automatic. What the mitzvah of tshuva adds is the vidui and the kabbalah lahaba. Those are the two elements which the Pasuk mentions according to the Ramad. The picha is the vidui, and the vavcha is the kabbalah lahaba. That's a bitzel's answer. And those, he says, aren't difficult. The difficult part is the Aziva Sachet. Once you have the Aziva Sachet and the Chirot that comes naturally, the Vidui and the uh, Kabbalah Labo are not difficult. That's what Ritzel says. Okay, very, very interesting point. I'd like to dwell on another point that Ritzel does not discuss. That Lechaira, if the Pasuk is referring to Vidui and Aziva Sachet, the Seder is Hafuk. The Seder is reversed. Because the Gemara Mesechus Tainus says the Salas, the Fezayim. It says if a person has an Aveira, and he's Mizvada, Vlo Chazerbo, he says Vidui, and he didn't back out. So he's considered like a person who's holding a Sheretz when he goes to the Mikvah. Taivo, the Sheretz Biyotho. The Tzvila is not Metai. The Ramah of Paschal is not a stupid. And he explains it, that if a person is misvada, v'lo gomar belibo lazoif, he did not resolve to give up the chet, there was no kabbalah lahaba, it's tayl v'sheretz b'yodo. So the say there can't be vidui, and then aziva sachet, and then kabbalah lahaba. It has to be first kabbalah lahaba, there's an aziva sachet and a kabbalah lahaba, and only after that there's the vidui, and it shouldn't be a tayl v'sheretz, the other. According to the Ramban, that the meaning of the Pasuk is the Pichu Bovavcha, Vidui, and then Kabbalah Lahaba, it comes out there should be a Chisar of Taibu Vesheret Viyada. Because if you do the Vidui first before the Kabbalah Lahaba, that's the Gemara Antinus. That's called Taibu Vesheret Viyada. You're going to the Mikveh, holding on to a Sheret. So according to the Ramban's Pshat, it should really say, it's in your heart, that's the Kabbalah Lahaba, and then it's in your mouth, the Vidui Falas. And according to the Ramban, the Seder Lucharei is Hafuch. This is the question that I'd like to point out. The truth is, it could be that the Ramban here follows the Sheet of Rabbeinu Yoyna and the Shari Tshuva. Rabbeinu Yoyna and the Shari Tshuva says that that Gemara in Masechus Tainus which says that if a person is misvada and wasn't going or believe Lazarif, it's called Taylor Vesheret Viyado, is not in all cases. It's in a very specific Ukimta. And if any Yona discusses this in the Shar, the mission of the Shari Chuba, 
where he talks about the 20 elements of tshuva. 20 different steps in the process of tshuva. And the, the second is aziv asachet. The second is aziv asachet, giving up the sin. And Ibn Yonir digresses and has a very, very interesting discussion as to what to say there. What is the order of tshuva? Now, the first ikr is charat, and Ibn Yonir is listening. The second is aziv asachet. What is the correct order? Is it charat and then aziv asachet, or is it aziv asachet and then charat? So Benyona points out that there's a contradiction in Sukkim in this subject. There's one part that says, If a person confesses his sin, he says vidui, then he abandons the sin, that person Hashem will have mercy on. No, it says vidui first. Vidui undoubtedly means there was a charat. If there's no charat, there's no remorse, then the vidui isn't sincere at all. So mode of ozeg means a person said vidui, that means he experienced remorse and he verbalized that in vidui. And then the ozeg, then he leaves the chet, he abandons the chet, Hashem will have mercy on him, which implies that the Seder is charata and vidui, and then aziva sa chet. There's another pasuk which says, ki achare shuvi nichamti. After I returned to the proper path, I felt remorse. Which implies that first there's an aziva sachet and a kabbalah haba, and then you experience harab. So how do you resolve this contradiction? Rabbi Yonah says there are two types of aveiras. So there's one type of aveira where a person is chayte b'mikra. A person's sin is just, it just happens. It's not a habit, it's not a pattern, it's out of character, it's inconsistent with the person's true essence. The Yitzhahar got the better of him. And he said, he was chayte b'mikra. So says Rabbi Yona, that in that instance, the first step in that person's tshuva is charaf. There the person will genuinely feel charaf. Because you do something like that, you do something which is so atypical, so unexpected, of course they'll be humiliated, they'll be embarrassed. So the charaf begins. And then he says, the charaf will bring you to an aziva sa chet. We'll get back to that in a moment. So, on such a person, the Pasuk applies, First you begin with Charata and Vidui, and then Aziva Sachet, and the person will be pitied by the Ribbon of But then you have another person who is Misyatse Valderach Leitai This is a person who has established a habit. He's established a habit. This is his way, this is his practice. He's not committed to the observance of the mitzvah. And that happens. I mean, the only explains, because the Gemara tells us, Kivin Sha'avar Adam Avera Vuhutra, if a person does an Avera and repeats it, Nas like a hetter, it becomes as if it's permitted. He has no qualms anymore. The brain is very, very competent at devising rationalizations, justifications, excuses, hetero. So if a person does an Avera twice, already it's not like a hetero. They say, the we saw Salante's name, that's if you do it twice. If you do it three times, it becomes a mitzvah. The Avera becomes a mitzvah. But even without that, certainly it becomes a dover heter. So that person doesn't feel any remorse. To the contrary, that mitzvah is no longer in his book. So how does that person begin the process of tshuva? It has to be there's some external impetus. Someone gives him a Musa Shmuz, he sees a Sefer, so on and so forth. But Charata will not kick in initially. For that person, says the Binyona, it's Fakert, it's the opposite. First, there's Aziva Sachet. After the Aziva Sachet, after the Kabbalah Laboa, when he sees how his life has improved, then he'll feel remorse. That's Achar Eshuvi Nichamti. The Muslim other Medina. Let's say a person who's a smoker. This is a habit. He's been smoking for years and years and years and years. He doesn't feel any remorse. This is his way. He smokes. And some smokers are very militant about their smoking. They, they are indignant when people try to stop them and curtail their rights to smoke in public areas. So Kharati is still not going to feel. So then one day his doctor tells him, listen, I've run some tests on you and I see that if you continue smoking, you're going to be dead in a very short period of time. So he gets a real ha and he stops smoking. 
After a while, after a few months, he stops smoking. He sees all sorts of benefits. First of all, people are willing to stand in his Dalaramas. <laughs> now, he saved a lot of money on cigarettes that he's not spending. And uh, his life is better in so many ways. He has a better appetite. He enjoys his food. But smokers, uh, really, their, their taste buds are very much affected by the uh, smoking. And now he can enjoy what he eats. So he sees his life is so much better. So then he tells himself, you know, I could have had this years ago. I was so foolish. Why did I wait so many years to stop? I could have stopped. I could never have started. So after he returns to the proper path and he realizes how much better it is in his old ways, then he'll feel corrupt, then he'll feel remorse. So it says in Ben Yonah that the order depends. In other words, if the person was chayteva mikra, then there'll be first charata, and then there'll be a aziva sachet with a kabbalah haba. But if the person is misyatse no derech chayteva tamid, he's a habitual sinner, then the Seder has to be the opposite. The Seder has to be first, there's an Aziba Sachet, Kabbalah Haba, and that will lead to Harav. Now it's very interesting. If you read the Reina Yona inside, there are some very, very wonderful Chidushim in this paragraph that are very easily missed. Sometimes, Sifrei Musar, people don't read very carefully. Reina Yona is from the G'dayli Arishayim. G'dayli Apaiskim. So we have to read even his Sifrei Musar with a very, very, very careful eye. When he speaks about the second type of person, the person who is Mesiatse Valdera Kotayva Tamid, and he says that person, his tshuva has to begin with Aziba Sachet, and then it comes to Charata, <coughs> he adds a Moshal. <coughs> Vaham Moshal was there. And the marshal for this is Lamisha Eiches Hasheretz, a person holding a Sheretz, Ubalitbo Lehitayer, he wants to immerse and become purified. Kianiach Hasheretz Tchila, first he has to put down the Sheretz, and then he can be Taibo. And as long as he's holding the Sheretz, the Tchila will not help. So Rabbi Yonah says that the marshal of Taibo Besheretz Biyado only applies to the person who's a habitual sinner. A person who's a habitual sinner, so it's not just that his tshuva starts with aziva sachet because charata is not going to naturally happen. His tshuva starts with aziva sachet because if he would start with charata and vidui, it would be a table of the He has to begin with aziva sachet. Or else there'll be a problem of table of the but it seems that the chayte b'mikra, there's no such rule. The person who's chayte b'mikra, if he will begin with vidui, there'll be no chisar of tevo v'sheretz b'yadu. Why should that be? Why should that be? I think the answer is partial. The marshal. Let's see if a person who's a smoker. He smokes. It's his regular habit. For years he's been smoking. He is a smoker even if at this particular moment he isn't smoking a cigarette. Go over a person on Shabbos and ask him, are you a smoker? Yes, I'm a smoker. Well, you're a smoker. not smoking now. <laughs> it's true not smoking now. But since this is his pattern, this is his way, it's not that he's only a smoker when he's smoking. He's a smoker when he's not smoking. This is what he is. He is a smoker. But let's say you have a, a kid in high school who well, once in a while he experiments with smoking. You're not going to say he's a smoker. He has smoked from time to time. But in between cigarettes, he's not a smoker. And that's the difference. When you the holes, when is, is there a chisar of Taylor Bashar's Biyado? When you, the chet is a part of you. It's your way, it's your lifestyle, it's your pattern, it's your habit. That's only the person who is misyatse v'oderach v'taymatam, but the person who sins habitually. So then, even when he's not committing the sin, he is dovuk to the chet. So if that person would begin with charata and vidui, he's a table v'sharat v'yav. You can't purify yourself. You are a smoker. You are a sinner in that area of observance. 
Therefore, that person who's misyatsev al derech lo tayv atomid, that person has to begin with azil asachet. If he begins with charata and vidui, that's a tayv of b'sharetz biyado. But the person who's chayti b'mikra, he's not a sinner when he's not sinning. He has sin, but this is not his lifestyle. This is not his pattern. So he's not called double to the chet, and therefore there's no chisar of tayv of b'sharetz biyado. If he begins with Charata and Vidui, that's a valid Charata and Vidui. Of course, he has to have an Aziva Sachet to complete the process of Chuba. But it's not a Chisar of Tevu Vesharat Biyara. That's what comes out from the Yom. But I think it's even deeper than that. There's an even bigger Kiddush in the Yom. If you go through the 20 steps of Ben Yom's Chuba, Ben Yom surprisingly does not count Kabbalah Lahabah as one of the steps. If you go through all 20, he does not count Kabbalah Lahaba. And in fact, when he talks about the tshuva of the person who's chayti b'mikra, there's no reference of Kabbalah Lahaba. This is how he says that person does tshuva. He begins with charata. He begins with charata. And then what? And then Akhre came after that, Yosef b'chayom yira sashem b'nafshah. He should add Yira Sashem. The Yita in Chitas and Lokim Belivo Bukhalais. And he should put the fear of God into his heart to the extent that he's confident that even if the Eitzahara attacks him again, he won't do the Chet again. That's it. That's all he says. There's no mention of the person needing to make some type of Kabbalah Lahabal. He experiences charata and then aziva sachet. What is aziva sachet? Aziva sachet means he adds yira shemayim to the extent that he's confident that even if the eight Sahara would seduce him again, he would not give it. But kabbalah lahabo, Rabbi Yehuda doesn't say. Only in the case of the misyatim of the the person who sins all the time. See here he says that. Rashis Chuba Su Ishazeh is Lazle Darko Mahshafta Hara. He has to abandon the sin. Ulahaskim Lekayim Ula Kabalalov and to accept upon himself by Yosef Lachtoi, not to sin anymore. And then Kharata and Vidud. So he only mentions Kabbalah Lahaba by the person who is misyativ of Darak Lotaif Tamit. So why is that? But if Kabbalah Lahabah is a chalak of tshuva, what difference is it what type of sin it is? The Nakud is like this. Rabbi Yayna is telling us that that really there is no halach of Kabbalah Lahabah. Rabbi Yayna rejects the concept of Kabbalah Lahabah. Kabbalah Lahabah is not necessary for tshuva. Except in one case. The person who habitually sins, he needs it for a very special reason. Why? So Rabbi Yayna earlier in the Sefer, has a long discussion of the evils of a person who delays doing tshuva. It's a terrible thing, a person who delays doing tshuva. And he gives many, many reasons why this is. But he says like this. He says, you should know that if a person repeats a sin, the tshuva becomes very difficult. Because nasa lokeheter. And then he says like this, Vitata, now Bina Shimazais, understand this very well, because there's an Ikr God. He says, there are tzaddikim that are nichshal bachet. It happens, it's sadik. Those are there, he's nichshal bachet. Ain't sadik barat hashiyas tevilayata, there's no tzaddik who's perfect. That's a terrible thing. But if a person habitually sins, the ain't no nikabal al nafshali shalom, and he doesn't accept upon himself. To observe that mitzvah, he's called a mashumat ludavar echad. He's a mashumat ludavar echad, a mumar ludavar echad. Ki amor yomar ha'eved l'rabo. If the slave says to his master, "Call Asher Tarma Eli Eze," I'll do whatever you ask of me. Zulasi davar echad, except for this one thing. If you ask me to do that, that I won't do. For shavar oil adoyn of me alav. He already has broken the yoke of his master. 
In other words, the Rinyan understands that a person who habitually sins, and it's not to look ahead there, he comes to the point where his taira doesn't have that mitzvah anymore. Everyone else's Torah has 613 mitzvahs, his Torah has 612 mitzvahs. He is essentially, once it's Nasa like a hat there, he essentially tells the Yavon I'll keep the entire Torah, whatever you ask, but not this. This, I don't do. Give him a Muslim on their In other words, if I go to a person in the street, tell me, do you keep Chadash? So yeah, that's a Chumrah some people keep, I don't keep that. Go to another person, do you keep Chadash Yisrael? That's a Chumrah some people keep, I don't keep that. So we all understand when it comes to a Chumrah, some people keep the Chumrah, some people don't keep the Chumrah. But you go to some people and say, do you keep Shabbos? No, I don't do that. No, I keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, Shabbos is one of them, it doesn't mean like that. But in other words, I keep kosher. I don't do Shabbos. Or you, well, another person, do you keep kosher? No, I don't do that. I don't keep kosher. I keep you know, whatever I keep. I don't keep kosher. In other words, it's not the shot that the person has merely sinned. The person who makes a habit out of sinning actually deletes entire mitzvahs from the Torah. He's a mashum of the Torah. He has told the Rebbe Mishlam, I'll do whatever you want, but not this. This I don't do. Like the uh, proverbial maid who doesn't do windows. <laughs> you know, I don't do this. I don't do that. So Biniona says here, the aziva sachet, to stop doing the sin, is mechayev a kabbalah. You have to accept the mitzvah, because the sin is not simply that you didn't keep kosher. The sin is that you rejected the mitzvah of kashrus. So that's mechayev a kabbalah. There has to be a kabbalah lahaba, because otherwise there's no aziva sachet. Because if I am fundamentally committed to the mitzvah, just uh, in, in moments of weakness, I stumble, but I am fundamentally committed. I don't need a Kabbalah Labla. I need an Aziva Sachet. Aziva Sachet says, Zibin Yon is here, Maisif, here are Shemayim, to the point that even if the Yitzhahara would entice you, you wouldn't relent. But the person who is a Meshum of the Racha, the person who is Mesyatim of the Racha, to the extent that it becomes part of his way, he has eliminated entire mitzvahs. He needs a Kabbalah Lahabah because that is the Chet. The Chet is not the not keeping kosher. The Chet is the rejection of the mitzvah. And the only way to rectify the rejection of the mitzvah, the only Aziva Sachet, is to a Kabbalah of the mitzvah. And the Rabbi Yonah says that's where Kabbalah Lahabah plays a role. Kabbalah Lahabah plays a role where the Chet is the Chet of rejection, so the Aziva Sachet is Kabbalah. But by the person who's chayt of a mikra, where the chet is not a chet of rejection, there Ben Yonah says, Bechlal, there's no need for Kabbalah Lahabo. This is a tremendous kiddush. If you read the Ben Yonah inside, you'll see that it is this way. And uh, if Ben Yonah is correct, then it's a tremendous nechama for all of us. But I think for many of us, Kabbalah Lahabo is very difficult. Not like Yubitzel said. Yubitzel said that Kabbalah Lahabo is so easy. Once you have Naziva Sachet, of course the Kabbalah Lahabo is easy. I think for most of us it's not that way. Most of us say, listen, I'll do my best to stop, but I can't commit myself. I can't promise. I can't pledge my sacred honor <laughs> that I'm never going to do it again. Who knows what will be? So I think many of us feel that I'm willing to do my best. I'm willing to try very hard not to do the Chet again. But I can't stand before the Rebunish Lord and say, I commit myself to never doing it again. A Kabbalah Labo that I can't make. According to Ben Yoyna, as long as you remain fundamentally committed to the mitzvah, you don't have to make a Kabbalah Labo. You have to make an Aziva Sechet. If you might say, you're Hashemai, to the point that you'll not do it again. But to pledge, to make a commitment, a Kabbalah, I won't do it, that's only necessary if the chet was a chet of rejection, which is only true in the case of the misyatsi of Darach Leitayva Tug. You'll see this is what Rabbi Yenya says. It's an amazing, amazing thing. But I'll upon you, even if we reject this, and even if we say that every Valchuva 
requires a Kabbalah lahaba, I think there's still a difference between the two types of chaitim, as Ibn Yonah says. The person who's misyatib or derech lo tamid, there, there has to be the Kabbalah lahaba before the vidui. Because there, there'll be a problem of toivu v'sharetz biyado. He is double to the chet, because his chet is a chet of rejection. How can it be mizvada before there's a Kabbalah? There's no aziva sachet. Whereas the person who is chayte the mikra, who is fundamentally committed to that mitzvah, even if he hasn't yet made the Kabbalah, there the purpose of the Kabbalah is only to demonstrate the strength of his resolve. But a vali is not called double to the chet to the extent that it's a table of the sharetz biyado, and therefore the order could be, as Ibn Yonah says, Maudah v'ozei. First there's Charata and Vidui, and then Aziva Sa Chet. Let's go back to the parish of Shuba. We, we ask, what, what is going on with the two Shubas? And the first Shuba emphasizes Ata Uvanecha, and the second Shuba is Ata Tashu. Now the Ramban is bothered by this expression, Ata Uvanecha. What does it mean? that you'll accept the mitzvahs atu v'anecha. So Ramban brings the psukim in Nehemia. It says that when the goylem to Bavo, the exiles turned from Bavo, they made a Kabbalah that they and their children would observe the Torah. As we know from the Ramban, Mr. Shabbos, that when the Jews went to the Golas Bavo, they genuinely thought that the Torah had lapsed. They held that the, their situation, Ramban brings a medrash, was tantamount to the case of Eved Shemach Roy Rabbo or Isha Shigir Shavayla. They were like a slave whose master sold him, or like a wife whose husband divorced her. The master has no claim to the Eved services, and the husband has no claim on the wife's services. That's what the, the goyulim to Bava really held. See, we have the benefit of hindsight. So we see a cyclical pattern of golos and gula, golos and gula. But at that time, the golos bubble was such a catastrophe, such an unimaginable catastrophe. They thought it really was a divine rejection. To the extent that when they came back from Bava, there had to be a new commitment, a new commitment. The new commitment has to be ato uvanecha. It can't be, I commit myself, my children will see. Just as the original Kabbalah Satoira was a Kabbalah Satoira Ludoiris, the nation said, we accept Torah and ourselves and our children for eternity. The, the new Kabbalah, the recommitment, has to be a Kabbalah of ato uvanecha, the Kabbalah of you and your children for eternity. That's the Shuvah of Chutzlaretz, the Shuvah of Gauls. Ramban is telling us that the problem in Golos is not simply the problem of people having done a virus. The problem in Golos is that the Kabbalah Satyra has lapsed. Now the truth is that we understand this better than perhaps even the Ramban understood it. But I don't know if the Ramban could have understood what he said as well as we understand it. Because we live in a time it's not just that people do Averis. We live in a time that there are alternative Judaisms. There is conservative Judaism, there's Reform Judaism, Reconstructionist Judaism. There are Judaisms which claim to be legitimate forms of the religion, which say that the mitzvahs of the Torah aren't binding. It's not just that conservative Jews are Machal Shabbos where the Reformed Jews eat trays. That's not the issue. The issue is, everyone has Averis. Maybe I've eaten trays. Maybe I've been Mechal Shabbos inadvertently. It's more than that. Here, there is no fundamental commitment to the mitzvah. Because we've, we've accepted the idea that there are alternative branches. There are branches of the religion. And yet, the Orthodox accept the authority of the Torah. And we do not accept the authority of the Torah to the same extent. We believe it's divinely inspired in us. Whatever it is, but it isn't binding in a legal sense. 
And you can be a good Jew, a Jew in good standing, without a fundamental commitment to the observance of the commandments that are written in the Bible. It's a totally different thing. We're not talking about a Vedas. We're talking about a rejection of the obligation to observe mitzvahs. So the Torah tells us that the precondition to the Kibbutz Goliath, the precondition to the return to Eretz Yisrael, has to be a commitment. Not perfect compliance. That's not the precondition. The precondition to the Kibbutz Goliath is commitment. We have to recommit ourselves that the Torah, the mitzvahs of the Torah, bind us. Until that happens, there can't be a Kibbutz Goliath. So therefore, how is that described? It's Atu Vanecha. It's Atu Vanecha. Because if it's my personal commitment, but it's not something which I feel I have to train my children to observe and encourage them to observe and perhaps even compel them to observe, that's not a Kabbalah satire. It's not the same Kabbalah as we had at Sinai. At Sinai, it wasn't just that we as individuals accept the Torah. We accept it to be bound by the mitzvahs of the Torah for eternity, the Torah. That commitment has to be reestablished, and that's Atu Uvona. There's no mention of the compliance, of the doing of the mitzvahs. That's not the issue. That'll come later. What Hashem wants as a precondition to the Kibbutz Goliath is commitment. You have to be committed to the Torah. You have to declare that I am bound by the Torah. That's the shafta ad Hashem lekecha, the shemata bekolo, ato uvonecha. We come to Eretz Yisrael. Now there's a second level of tshuva. The second level of tshuva is compliance. The first tshuva is commitment. The second level is compliance. So here we come to Eretz Yisrael. And it says, Va'ata Toshav, you'll repent. When it comes to compliance, everyone has to make his own commitment. Because I can't force my children to comply with the Torah. There can be a Kabbalah which binds future generations, but there's no way I can guarantee their compliance. This has to be a commitment which is very, very personal. That's va'ata tashav. You will repent. And here, the personal repentance is your sisa, you'll perform all the mitzvahs. So I, I think that our understanding of the two tshuvas is different than the mouth we spoke about last year. It's not that simply the first tshuva is tshuva meyira and the second tshuva is tshuva meyava. It's two totally different commitments. The tshuva of galos is the tshuva of commitment and acceptance. The tshuva of Eretz Yisrael is the next level. That's the tshuva where there's a Kabbalah of compliance. Not only will we be bound by the mitzvahs of the Torah, we are going to carry them out. We are going to implement them. Comes the Ramban. The Ramban says that the next parsha, Ki HaMitzvah HaZais, is a reference to the tshuva HaNizkeros. It's a reference to the aforementioned tshuva. Which tshuva? The first tshuva or the second tshuva? So I would conjecture the Ramban here is speaking of the second tshuva. In other words, the first tshuva, making the commitment, is very, very difficult. To make a commitment you're bound by the Torah is very difficult. We see it not in the Torah itself. It has to be kafalei and mara gigigas. I had to compel them to make that kabbalah. And that kabbalah the Torah wouldn't say that it's lo niflais, lo v'chayka, lo v'shemayim, lo me'ever liyam, ki kara ve'lach adavu ma'ay. That initial Kabbalah, which is the precondition for the Kibbutz Goliath, is very, very difficult. But once there is a fundamental commitment, once there is a fundamental commitment, now the question is implementation. And that the Torah says, that if we're only dealing with carrying out, then it's not difficult. Once there's a commitment, it's not difficult. On that, what is the Seder? As we said, 
that when the tshuva is a tshuva for the chet of rejection, then the seder has to be Kabbalah and then vidui. Otherwise, it's a total of a share to be other. When we're talking about the tshuva of a person who is fundamentally committed, it's only a question of a lapse in observance, then the seder of tshuva can be vidui and then azivasa chet. And that's why the seder is bepichel uvavcha vasa so. First vidui and then azivasa chet. Now, this is a technical uh, explanation of the, the parsha. But I think there is a nepudi here. There is a point which we've spoken out in the past, which I think is a dvar musar, something we have to hear. What is difficult, what is difficult in the Avodah Satshuva is because Deep down, we are always harboring doubts. Maybe it isn't really necessary. Maybe I really don't have to do this. Maybe I can weasel out of it. Maybe I can escape it. We know that there's a concept of Kabbalah's Ol Malchu So what is Kabbalah's Ol We accept the yoke. What does that mean, we accept the yoke? Kabbalah's Omach HaShemayim is our understanding that there is no alternative. This is the way it is. When we understand that, we're not resentful. We're not scheming, maybe we can avoid it. Once we understand this is the way it has to be, this is the way it has to be. You have a Muslim mother of a daughter. Let's say a person, he's uh, working for a company, and he has a very disagreeable boss. So he's very, very uncomfortable. Yeah, he complains and he's upset and he's wishing it could be otherwise. Now, there are many other inconveniences in life. For example, the fact that we have to breathe you know, probably uh, 10 or 15 times every minute. That's inconvenient. Wouldn't it be so much better if we didn't have to breathe so often? Or if we have to eat a few times a day, wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to eat so often? Would they have to sleep every night? Wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to sleep every night? So why don't we complain about those things? See, those things we have accepted. So as we understand that being a human being means you have to breathe, it means you have to eat, it means you have to sleep. There's no point in, in, uh, in protesting. You know, our little children protest those types of things. Now, why do I have to eat? Why do I have to go to sleep? You know, and we rightfully look at them as children for protesting these things. You can't argue with that. That's nature. That's the way the world is made. You have to eat and you have to sleep. There's no point in fighting it. But the child isn't intelligent enough to understand that yet. So we have to understand the same thing. There's no point in fighting it. There are certain things, this is the way they are, this is the way they have to be. We have to make the most of it and just accept it. That's Kabbalah's own Malchus Right? The Rebonus one was not going to retract the mitzvahs. He's not going to change the mitzvahs. This is the Torah. It's obligatory on us. The world thinks this is for our best. That's the way it is. So when we have that fundamental commitment, it's easy to live up to it. What makes it difficult is because we're always thinking, maybe there's a way out. Maybe I can escape. Maybe I can avoid. No, I spoke to Svasemus once. The Svasemus says, and it brings a, a medrash in Parshas Chayisar. It says about Eliezer. The medrash calls Eliezer an Evid Maskil. He was a very wise Evid. So he says, why was he a wise Evid? Because Eliezer was really a descendant of Chal. It was decreed upon him that he should be an Evid. And he said like this, he said that, you know, I, I have to be an Evid. So who should I work for? I could work for a barbari, some barbarian, or I could work for a Vramamina. Better I should work for a Vramamina. So the manager says, oh, that brilliant insight, he was an Evan Maskell. He's a brilliant, he's an understanding Evan. So the Shasemus asks, what is the brilliant insight? This is like genius to understand that it's better to work for Roma Vino than to work for uh, a barbarian? The Shasemus, that's not the, the brilliant understanding. The understanding is his first statement, I know I have to be an Evan. So most people, 
you tell them that your Latin life is to be an Ebed, they're trying to escape it. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says, Avda Bevkeir Nikolai. An Ebed loves to live the promiscuous life. Why is that? Because he's looking for freedom. He's looking for some way to assert his independence, to assert his freedom, to say, I'm not a slave. I'm a master of my own life. So if you can exercise a little area of freedom in terms of promiscuity, that's what he'll do. So Eliezer was a genius because he understood it's a decree, it's a gzera, this was the curse of Nayak, that I am meant to be in heaven. Now that I, that's a given, no, you make the most of it. If you can be in heaven anyway, certainly, <laughs> everyone understands. It's better to work for an Abraham Lovino than work for a barbarian. But uh, the genius of Eliezer was he understood what is meant to be has to be. We have to understand that too. In other words, our lives would be easier in terms of our mitzvahs, etc., if we understood this is the way it is. This is the way it has to be. That's Kabbalah's Lomach Hashemayim. The Torah is not going to change. The Lach is not going to change. We have to adapt ourselves to the halacha rather than thinking that maybe there's a way out. Maybe we can make a deal or figure something out and maybe have a bro who minimizes demands or maybe I can move to a community which is less demanding, which really is an illusion because the Torah is true for all communities in all times and all places. But that is the idea. It says once we, there is fundamental commitment, basic commitment, then everything falls into place. And that's the idea. The tshuva of golos, which is the tshuva of commitment, was in golos we reached the point, whether it was the golos bubble or whether it's our modern golos, where the very commitment for Shmira Samitsis has lapsed. To the extent that many believed then and believe now that they're not binding. That tshuva is very, very difficult. And that tshuva is the precondition to the people's goliath. Hashem says, until that commitment is there, there's nothing to talk about. He says, but the second tshuva, the toshuv, the tshuva seretz Yisrael, which is the tshuva of implementation, of carrying out, that tshuva already, once there's a fundamental commitment in the Kabbalah soil, that tshuva is kar avelecha adavr ma'ayv, v'pichol b'vavcha la asoso. This is Hashem. This is our last class of Tav uh, Shanaim Beis. Next week will be Rosh Hashanah. And uh, there will be no class the Sunday of Aseris to make Shuvah. But this is our next class, therefore, will be the Sunday after Simchas Torah, which is before Parshas Nayach. Everyone should have a Ksiva, a Ksiva Toiva, a good, good banished year, happiness, and success. Ruchnius, Gashmius as well, and this is Hashem. We should all have a, a very, very, very good year in every sense. In Toshinai and Gil. Amen.